Today is Wednesday, June 28th. This is the post up. I'm Ryan Sampson, joined by Dexter Henry and Brandon London. Guys, how are we doing today? Doing good, man. Doing good. Just good. Yeah, I'm doing it's, I'm doing great. Feet actually. Over six feet over. I mean five eleven feet over ground right now. And you <laughs> and 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 you just feeling good. Oh, come on. You're you cutting I, an inch short. I'm like that. I'm like what five feet eleven. He's saying I'm not dead. That's what he's saying there. But That's like, yeah, yeah. I, I I I got it. I got it, Brandon. I got Kendrick it. Lamar with it, Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> I got it. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Listen, if you're new to the program, this is the post up where we run down to the top stories in sports, and this gives us a chance just to dive a little bit deeper into these stories that we see going on and trending. And guys, let's start with our top story. Uh, it came out news today: the NFL is going to be suspending more players for an entire season, including. Uh, Colts cornerback Isaiah Rodgers. He's going to be slapped for an entire season long suspension, just like Calvin Ridley was a couple of seasons uh, last season, obviously. And listen, it's not just Calvin Ridley. We knew that there was going to be more suspensions coming. We saw what happened to the Detroit Lions, including players like Jamison Williams, guys who are, are, who are gambling on sports. And it's not just sports gambling, it's also betting on the NFL. And there's, this is a hot topic, obviously. Now, the sports gambling world is really it's intruding into everyone's lives and it's in getting into the NFL players as well. So I got to ask you guys a question. Are you surprised by how many players are being found guilty of doing the sports gambling? No, I just look at this as another vice or another stain for the NFL and NFL players. But because you think about the off season, which you usually hear when you hear bad news, some sort of domestic abuse or some sort of DUI, drunk driving, some sort of some guys got in a fight at a club or nothing. Now this year, it's it's the gambling. It's guys getting time taken away from them in terms of on the field because they're gambling. And I know a lot of players have come up, come out and said, you know, I didn't know what the rules were or what the – when I was at the Jets OTAs, Lake and Tomlinson was asked that question. Has someone come in and spoke to you all about what the rules are? He said, absolutely. Abs and they made it exactly clear what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. So what this is doing is take away from their money, not only from on game checks, but just think of the money you make in terms of people drafting you on, on fantasy, you, you balling out on the field and someone knowing who you know, who you are now, Brian Sampson out in Fresno, if you watched yesterday, now he knows who you are now because his fantasy, he went and picked you up. You're missing money in terms of the digital world now as well. So it's a double whammy, uh, Dexter, these days. And this is hurting them more than, than any other. Well, obviously other, other things are worse, but this is hurting. This is going to hurt players a lot more than a lot of other things. Yeah, and, and the thing is, Brandon, you know this being a, a former athlete, professional athlete, and playing in the NFL, you, as an athlete, you got to know the rules, right? Like, there's no excuse for this whatsoever. I'm not surprised at how this has gone because guys are taking chances. I think what I am surprised about is how sloppy guys have been, right? Betting on their own teams, betting at the team facilities, all that stuff. The sloppiness of it is what surprises me. Now, I think what's interesting is last week news came out where the NFL said, they're cracking down on this. They're going to reiterate these policies to the players. They would have uh, league officials come around to the different teams, to their training sites. You heard Brandon just talk about Lake and Thompson just saying that he had already spoken to somebody. I think it's good what the league is doing. But, guys, the rules are simple. There's six, six simple rules here. One, don't bet on the NFL. Two, don't gamble on your team facility while traveling for a road game or staying at a team hotel. Three, don't somebody bet for you. Four, don't share team inside information. Five. Don't enter a sports book during the NFL playing season. And six, don't play daily fantasy football. And I that's the, easy, man. That's that is that's easy. what I'm saying. Yeah, it's it's easy, right, Brandon? Like, like these I, are simple rules that you think guys would not be able to get in trouble, but for some reason they are. Go ahead, B. I remember when guys used to, to win the drug test. Guys have failed drug tests. That was a big thing. Everybody like, just stay off the weed. Man, it's weed, man. Like, like come on. Now, now it's turned out that weed is legal and all. But this gambling thing... They're not going to scale back on that. They're not going to relax on that because I know everyone wants to try and say, uh, oh, well, the NFL is in bed with sports books. How can you expect It is, a, though. You know, they, they are. are. But this could change. This could mess up your check. If someone is found betting or costing or tanking a game, you you just messed up my check in the locker room. You, let's say you you in with the bookies or something goes on. That's what they're trying right. to prevent. Right. Because, and that's where fist fight, that's where dudes like come up out on you right. if you mess up the in-house, the locker room money. 
And it's not like Isaiah Rogers is a nobody player. He he, no. he contributes to this team. So when you're betting, and he you was found guy. guilty of betting on the Colts, he's yeah. betting on his yeah. own team. Yeah, yeah. So and this is the taboo discussion we talk about when sports gambling in, it gets involved with the actual sport of the NFL. Obviously, like we said, the NFL makes a ton of money off of gambling partnerships with all those sports books that we see and all those mobile digital sports books that we see. And it's it's that taboo discussion of if you're playing that sport, you cannot be gambling on that sport. And just yeah. like Dexter said, Lee laid out, laid out rules and stipulations and like, just don't do it. Don't yeah. take part. And I understand it. it's 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 there and it's like it's fun like i know i sports gamble a lot and I, I know dex gets involved with it a little bit it's it's a fun thing to do but when you're playing the sport itself and you're getting paid top dollar to play that sport it's getting really muddy and murky and i'm sure not not only just the league itself the owners are aware of it they're concerned coaches yeah. are probably talking to these guys like listen can't be doing it cuz you're like you said brandon you're affecting everyone else's paycheck and especially if you say I bet if I'm Isaiah Rogers and I bet on my Colts defense to let's say have a couple of sacks or under in team total sacks and a guy, you tell him like, Hey, dog it on this play. Like, I, you know, we don't need a sack quarterback on this last couple of plays. It's like, Whoa, 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 whoa. Now we're getting really like into and, it. And that, and that's a murky area too, because usually if a player is going to bet on their team, then they're going to try and ball out because they're going to try to have some sort of impact in the game, but they're still, you, there's still that other side of the argument to where it's like, like you're saying, there is that negative side of it, and that's where the murky waters get. So I don't care if it's a twenty, fifty, hundred thousand dollar bet; it's not worth not only a year or a half a year of game checks, but it's not worth that stain on your image as well. Jamison Williams, that's two strikes now when it comes to the to the NFL. One, he came in hurt, so he missed a lot of last season. First round pick. That's a, that's first, first round pick. pick. So that's yep. a strike on your your durability or your uh, availability because he missed the majority of last season. Now all the reports of him being healthy, him looking good in Lions camp, up oh, oh, oh him looking good in terms of the workouts, up into that OTA part where now you get the news that he's going to be out for a uh, half of what six games, six, six games, games, six, six games. games. It's like, dude, like that's worse than you re-injuring yourself. Yeah. Not, I, Go ahead, Dave. I, no, I agree with that. And there's one other thing I just want to say before we move on, because I think you're going to hear from people that are going to say, what's the big deal? Why can't these guys bet on games? The NFL, they're being hypocrites because they've allowed gambling. So I want to address this really quickly and say that, no, it's the same as if you work for a company, right? We all work for the New York Post. If the New York Post gives us, you know, stock options, there's rules to it, right? There's insider things trading. that you can't do, insider trading, right? You can't you certain you can't trade certain amount. You can't only hold this amount of percentage. It's the same thing with gambling. When you work for an organization and all these players that work for the teams, they are and they are, those teams that work for the NFL. They can you cannot have insider information. You could share that. You can do all that. That's why it's murky waters, as Brandon said. It is very dangerous. You have to protect the integrity of the game. And guys, they put out six rules. Six rules that Brandon, who's a former professional athlete, said is pretty simple to follow. Just follow it, man. Take the gambling apps off the phone. Don't have anybody body bet for you. Just follow the six yeah, rules. That's that's the okay. tough one, Dex. The, don't have your friends gamble for you because they'll they'll track yeah, that right away. That's the hardest yeah. one. Hey, he went full corporate Dexter on us just now. I know, I know. <laughs> 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 growth, hashtag growth. No, and one thing, and now one thing to wrap all this up too for me, like Brandon Dexter. You know my favorite bets first touchdown. They script their plays. They script their first 10 plays. And if the players that are betting on their own teams know the script of the plays, that's when you get really, really shady stuff. All right, guys, let's go to our next topic. Stay in the NFL here. Travis Kelsey got a little honest here and talked about when he saw former teammate Tyreek Hill get traded to the Miami Dolphins and signed a huge extension for $130 million. Travis Kelsey said it hit me in the gut a little bit because when you look at Travis Kelsey's contract and the way it's structured right now, he's the third highest play, paid tight end in the NFL but he only has a cap charge of $11.5 million. Now, when we're going to talk about Travis Kelsey and what he does for this Chiefs offense, it's bar none. It's the most important thing, I think, for Patrick Mahomes. He's a safety blanket. He's his go-to target on third down. He's his, his best wide receiver option on that team right now, now that Tyreek Hill obviously is no longer there. When you think about Travis Kelsey and the type of career he's had, already had, he's already on a Hall of Fame trajectory here. Is he underpaid? And is he right to say, you know, it hits him in the gut? Like, maybe I should wonder, like, how much would I fetch if I went on the open market as a free agent? Yeah, he's right. Yeah, he's right to 
to question that. It should make us question the whole thing, right, about salary caps. Like, do we need them? We exist in a free market economy. Um, people are able to get paid as much as they want in whatever profession they want. But somehow, especially in football, which is a very dangerous sport, which is always my argument for players in that sport, they should be able to make as much money as they possibly can based on their value. T Travis Kelsey is absolutely undervalued and absolutely underpaid. Now, I understand why it hits him in the gut. Um, and I think it's just we should have more of a conversation about what are we really doing in American sports? We say we love capitalism, the free economy, but then players can only are limited to what they can make. Um, meanwhile, owners are making bank. Roger Goodell's making bank, as, as Brandon talked about yesterday there, too. So, yeah, I, I think the system, particularly when you're talking about the NFL and where players' bodies are really on the line, we're really talking about that. Yeah, I have a problem with that, and I think he's right to speak to speak out against that. However, you know, I, I wouldn't have minded to see Travis, Travis Kelsey. He might want to try to go and get his money. I know he's getting older in years, and he doesn't have the opportunity that um, Tyreek Hill had a couple, you know, a couple seasons ago to to flee and leave and get traded to the the Dolphins. But yeah, look in the NFL, I say it all the time. This is why I support the players. Get that bag when you can, because careers are so short. Get that bag when you can. His situation comes down to you can play the pay or you can you can you can play the play. Dang, I just messed it up. I had a whole <laughs> you're thing, all good. Man. I had a you, whole thing. No, 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 you, I, I get what you're saying though. You could you two choices here, right? If you're Travis Kelsey, you could stay and win Super Bowls with Patrick Mahomes, arguably the greatest young you quarterback and talent that back. we've seen, or you can go get paid. Or yeah. you could go get paid, but there's pain that comes with that pay. Because yes. now you're on a you on a sorry squad and you're losing. You're going three and thirteen. Just think of how miserable you are at three and thirteen. That's when you start thinking in your head, yo, I got all this money. Why am I even playing it? Like I, we're not even winning, you know. So that makes you contemplate retirement faster. So you can miss out on that back end of that extra three years. Like for a guy like him, I'm I'm paying or I'm I'm cutting some of that pay to play with the head and shoulders dude who just bought into the Kansas city Royals, who are going to be one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. I'm winning super bowls and I'm building my leverage. I'm building my brand. Build his legacy. He doesn't even have to go. I don't have to go to a big market. I'm in Kansas city. They know him for barbecue. You know what I'm saying? Like, so he doesn't even have <laughs> yeah. to go to a big market. He's building his legacy. He's building his brand just by being there with Patrick Mahomes and benefited off of winning those super bowls. Now, because of that 14 mil, that his cap hit is this year, you're happy that they're even giving you that for one player because technically they can go get two tight ends for seven mil, seven mil, and distribute the ball around, and but then bring in somewhere else so, because they got to pay a lot of that cap hit is on Patrick Mahomes. So you're 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 paying or you're giving up some pay just to be able to play. A couple things with Travis Kelsey that I wanted to say. He what like I said I said in the beginning. He is special in what he does. He's not, for me, he's not just a tight end. I know he can block really well and he does some really cool things down the field. But when he, when you talk about him and the, the value he has to this offense, I kind of see him as that second quarterback on this team. He knows the offense that Andy Reid wants to run, run, right? I mean, he helped Patrick Mahomes his first year come into the league and welcome him from Alex Smith to Patrick Mahomes. Travis Kelsey, his impact is undeniable. Ball. What's that? That's because he wanted the ball. <laughs> right. But like, but he, he's such a good target though. Yeah, you know yeah, how good yeah, he is yeah. after the, after the catch yards, after the catch, he's always one of the best. I think in my personal opinion, he's the most talented tight end I've probably ever seen. He stayed remarkably healthy in his career. He's only going to turn 34 this year. I, it's undeniable the effect and impact he has on this chiefs offense. Cause we talked about the chiefs, right? When, when Tyree kill got traded away, how would this offense look without Tyree kill? Everyone said, you know what? They're going to take a step back. Even how great Patrick Mahomes is. You know, that's a, that's a guy you can't re replace. They went and won the goddamn Super Bowl, guys. I mean, excuse my, my language, but truth, like, that's what they did. They went out there and won the Super Bowl. So I don't know if a guy like Travis Kelsey, I, I have a feeling he has more impact than a Tyree Kill. If you took him off that Chiefs roster, then we can really start talking about can this Chiefs team actually make a run like they did last year without did, a Travis did Kelsey. Say, did you just say Travis Kelsey is more important than Tyree Kill? Oh, like, here we go. 100 percent that's that's the all types of caps man like cap locks all types of caps like <laughs> back caps all bruh tyree kill it actually lucked up in that situation too because usually when you leave or you get traded away you get traded away for you know to a to a houston texans or to one right. of the bottom teams but he actually lucked up to a good position but his skill set 
you got to pay a guy like that. There ain't no trying to shortchange that type of uh, product and uh, productivity and that type of greatness on the field. But I see what you're saying. Kelsey can, this could be his last year there and then maybe sneak in one or two years at a sorry team and get, get extra amount of bag, make sign for instead of 14, let's say get 16 a year for those last two years. But he ain't, you're, you're just not going to get paid in the Kansas City. I always see, I feel like what Ryan brought up, yes, it does show the greatness of Kelsey. I do think it's a good point. But oh, also, absolutely, like, absolutely. But, absolutely. But, by no, but no doubt, it also shows the greatness of Mahomes because I was questioning their offense last year and we saw what Mahomes did. And it's like, look, I wouldn't bet against Mahomes. You took Kelsey off of there, he still found a way to make it work. That's how bad I think that man is. He's 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 amazing. He played off. Like, I don't need either one of y'all. Like, they could get rid of Travis Kelsey <laughs> and bring somebody in and Mahomes. Yeah. Make, yeah, make I just think I just think Travis Kelsey has that argument. He is the wide receiver type. You know, oh, he's no, so no, effective. Yeah, yeah. It, he's not yeah. just the tight end. You know what I mean? Yeah. And tight end is not a high high paid position in the NFL currently. It's one of the lower paid positions. All right, guys, let's go to our next topic here. Kevin Durant. Uh, he had some let you know Jason McIntyre in the media for the I believe it was uh, Volume Network. Correct. He had some criticism on Kevin Durant and how he interacts with fans and social media. And he's been involved in Twitter spaces and going back and forth about his legacy and, you know, his career and people love crit critiquing Kevin Durant, but Kevin Durant likes giving it right back to everyone. So I got to toss to you guys about this subject. How do we feel about Kevin Durant interacting with the media and his critics and really just, he, he he's defending himself out there in, in the public. Oh, Brandon, I thought you was going to Oh, I'll go. Well, yeah. I mean, if you're going to go at somebody, you better expect some sort of clap back. There's levels to trolling. And especially, no disrespect to a Jason, a Jason Singletary or whatever. You're doing, you're on the Colin Coward show. You're doing your thing. I understand this is all clickbait and all, but to try and tell Kevin Durant what he needs to do, where instead of wasting your time, where instead of doing this, what do you mean instead of doing something? You act like the man's not in the gym. He's just on there clap back in and all that. The man is arguably one of the greatest shooters, going to be one of the greatest basketball players of all time. So who are you to tell Kevin Durant instead of you need to be? It looks like he's doing pretty well doing what he's doing and clap backing. And we like this type of stuff. Like, why can't he go on there? and clap back with friends uh, against uh, fans and stuff. Do we know that that internally hurts him inside? Do we know that he sits there and he, he sits there and cries about it? Or he could be getting a kick out of it because at the end of the day, we can say, oh, you don't want your championships. or All we're doing is, all you're doing is arguing with him, talking about asterisks by his greatness. Like you're talking to a great, talking about the asterisks to a, his greatness. So he got the ultimate clap back at all times. So I, you know, go ahead, go go. Someone jump in on that because I Dex, don't like. I don't I, why, like. Why is Kevin Durant look like a bad person for clapping? I don't back? think he does, but that nah, oh, I don't. Dude, I don't think he no, looks like. I don't think he looks like a bad person for clapping back. And I think this has a lot to do with the athlete fan relations now, whether it's at games or on social media. There's a lot of fans out there that think they can say whatever they want, right? And they troll to the level that you hear Brandon talking about because they think nobody's gonna clap back at them. It's nice sometimes. You got to let people know where they stand. Like, even what we do as media personalities, you have comments on Twitter. And for the most part, you know, you ignore it. You know, you got haters, you got trolls out there. You ignore it. I think most of them Kevin Durant ignores. I've made an argument that I think he cares too much about what other people say. But I do think it's right to sometimes you got to check people. Sometimes you got to let them know. Have like Brand like Brandon saying, you're not in my league. You have not done this. You have not played professional he basketball. He called him broke boy, by the way. Yeah, sometimes you got to let people know. I'm fine with that, right? Like, I'm totally fine with that. And I think every once in a while, you have to have a good clap back. I don't think for us that are, you know, on camera, playing professional sports, you get, you can't dwell on everything because there's just too much out there. But I do think once in a while, you got to check people. It's okay to check people sometimes. And I don't, I don't fault Kevin Durant for checking people. As long as it's not affecting him personally, Right or his game and his professional, what he does on the court, yeah, clap back because sometimes people on Twitter they go way too far, and you gotta let them know when they're not your lead. Fine with that. And Listen, in our I, business, in our business, you say thank you if you're Jason Singletary. Go probably look at Jason McIntyre. Jason McIntyre. Oh, Let's Jason get this McIntyre. right. Why do I keep saying Singletary. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> go look. Go look at his numbers before, and then go look at his numbers with that tweet that mm. after Kevin Durant just engaged with you. That's our business anyway. We all we, we just trying to clickbait and get people to say stuff anyway. 
Like, but at the end of the day, you better be able to, if you can dish it, you better be able to take it. And this and it's, it's war online. It is what it is. Yep. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm all for it. I think it's great to see Durant go back and forth with fans and then go back at the media critics. Cause to be honest with you, I don't know who Jason McIntyre is. Kevin Durant shouldn't care what he has to say. And listen, Durant knows his legacy. I think we're in this world now, like you guys, this media world where everyone's always critiquing and always criticizing, being the first one to slam a player for doing, you know, joining a super team or if they're they're not pulling their their let their part in whatever championships they win. But at the end of the day, you can't deny his greatness. Everyone's got to recognize Kevin Durant's one of the greatest shooters ever. Going to go down as one of the greatest players ever. And listen, if he wants to go back and forth the fans, I think it's I think it's more fun and entertainment for us, especially when we're covering it. Ryan, can I get a quick question to you? You're the Go producer. Ahead. You're the producer. So for what Kevin Durant has done, his basketball resume, and then what he's shown kind of personality-wise, mm-hmm. would you put him in an NBA on TNT in the future? Or would you put him on some sort of show? Easily. I think he'd be a great personality to put on. Like He'd be, he'd be great with Chuck. He'd be great with Shaq. He's, he's that type of personality. He might need a little bit of work here and there. But honestly, if he keeps it fresh and he keeps it the way he likes going back and forth to people – I, I, I think he'd probably be a hit, to be honest with you. Damn. But that's if he wants to do it. If he wants to keep doing it on social media, he can keep doing that too. You know, there's no harm in that, obviously, too. Clap that king. <laughs> All right, guys. Our next topic here is uh, Tennessee State and HBCU College is going to be one of the first to implement a hockey program. And I think this is going to be awesome to see and awesome to watch. And it's great to expand the sport of hockey. But I want to toss the decks here because he knows a little bit more about this story and, and talk about how, what's going on here. Yeah, I spoke a couple months ago with my man, Nick Guerrero, who's the uh, assistant uh, director of communications with Tennessee State down there. He told me this was coming. So I, I knew this and it finally got announced. So I was going to start as a club program. And the hope is there's no timeline yet, but the hope is that it will then expand to them actually competing at a Division One level. And hopefully here on Neil Post, we're able to talk to some of the people. That'll happen. We're working on that so we can talk to some of the people um, around that with Tennessee State. Brandon and I were talking about that today. and. Listen, let's let's just let's just talk about what it is. Historically, black colleges haven't. This has never happened before. This is historic. There has not been a, a hockey program, and there hasn't been a lot of black people playing hockey just overall throughout the years. And as we know, the NHL has been trying to expand a lot of stuff with that. With hockey is for everyone. Um, they have a lot of people I've talked to in in that realm who've been doing a lot in terms of trying to expand the game um, for black players. I've talked to players like PK Subban. Um, about this uh, over the last couple of years. And so I think this is really great. I wonder what this expansion does for other um, HBCUs. And I would like to also be clear about something because I think some people in our viewing audience may not know this. HBCUs, historically black colleges and university, while most of the population of these schools are black, there are people of all other backgrounds. There are white folks, oh, there are Latino folks that go there and play. So this is, I think, a large part. It's not going to be like a whole bunch of all black students playing hockey. You're not going to see that. There are going to be white students on these campuses at Tennessee State playing hockey. And I think the other dope thing that they're doing is they're um, they're also partnering with the Nashville Predators, uh, who are very strong in the community there around Tennessee State and what they do. And they're doing a lot of outreach and stuff there, too. So I think it's going to be good. It's going to grow interest in the game. Um, I'm really intrigued to see how it expands to other HBCUs, but it's a historic day. I mean, hockey is not a sport that you see played at a lot of HBCUs, and I'm really intrigued to see how this moves going forward. And I think it'll be pretty well attended by the people of Nashville because they really come out and see the Predators. They support them well there. So right. I think it'll be really interesting, too. So it's a good, it's a, it's a great program, a good start, historic day. I'm glad we're talking about it. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and, and just on the sense – of Dexter, I hope this like breaks a stereotype or a stigma within our own community about guys who are black and play hockey. You know, they're not looked at as oh, you don't play basketball, you don't play football, that right, you know, you're some sort of cornball because you play a lacrosse or you play a hockey or or something in that manner, you know, one of those type of sports. You know, it's it's it's, it's sports at the end of the day. What do you mean? This is a your sport, this is a my sport, this is a this color sport. You whack for playing in that sport. Like, I remember growing up, everybody was talking about soccer. Remember soccer was like, oh, you play soccer? Lo and behold, Cristiano Ronaldo, Karim Benzema is getting all types of salty money right now, like we <laughs> talked about yesterday. Yeah. I would have went through that. Like, it was like as a kid, if I would have known, that would have been the payout uh, uh, in the future. But at the end of the day, man, uh, we don't know yet if it's going to be a men's or a women's team or if it's going to be both. 
Uh, they're going to announce that tonight, Wednesday, at the NHL draft with the Nashville Predators. Um, but during the t- last season, there were 62 active D1 men's programs compared to 37 Division One women's programs. So it's not like it's the it's FBS football where there's a right. hundred something schools out there. Right. If they're actually going to get a, it's good for them to go to club level. It's good to to crawl before they walk before they get out there and actually get competitive. So that I mean, this is just good all around. And then if you want to talk. Because we this is capitalism, as we were talking. Like you want to talk money, this gonna just think of the HBCU nights that the Nashville Predators are gonna have. This is gonna bring revenue. This is gonna right. bring money. This is gonna be able to be able to write taxes off for donating and stuff. So I mean, it's great for not only the the image of it all, but financially, and it can break down barriers and stereotypes and stigmas yes. within multiple communities. And I think one thing you brought up there that was really good, Brandon, about that and talking about the stigmas and how um, different sports have looked, right? You know, you talked about if you would, I'm, I'm a, I always love soccer and I played a little bit of soccer, but you would have played it too. It tells you a lot about with certain sports. And I think that's always been the barrier in hockey. It's not that black folks haven't wanted to play it. It's just access to it. Hockey's a very expensive sport to play. You got to have access to the rink, all of that, right? So it's not just a race thing. It's a socioeconomic thing as well, too. And I think that, it's just access. It's opening up access to more people. And I think when we do that more in sports and we, it's truly really about everybody being able to play, then I think that's a good thing. We want to be inclusive, not exclusive. And I think, you know, these are programs like this or seeing this at an HBCU is a, is a really good start. And it's not about just black players playing, but even the saying like, Hey, we can have other folks come to an HBCU and see what the culture is like and learn from that, understand why HBCUs are important and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, man, I think I think it's a good thing. I was glad you talked about the inclusivity because I think that's a major thing in, in talking about it as well, too. And it's going to be great for the community, obviously, down there in the Nashville, Tennessee area. And it, like you said, inclusivity, it, it's going to break down some barriers. As a hot, diehard hockey fan, I love to see it. I you know, I think the more the merrier because hockey doesn't get enough, enough love of the four major sports when we talk about here in America and getting more inclusion and more people to be involved in that type of sport i think it'll make for better for the sport in the long long haul right, right guys you, before you the producer oh, yeah. i got another show for you i got let's go show. let's go i like this. <laughs> i mean just think years they go on they come out of the club level they get to the ncaa level they get beat a couple times and then they win the hockey championship Tell me that in a netflix that's movie, a movie. Like, it's, it's a movie it's the Tell next me movie. that's not netflix we are marshall Yep. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> it's, come on it's, now. Remember the Titans? It's it's going to be a, an incredible movie. And honestly, right, it's a great story. And I, and I hope it I hope it comes true. I really do. Uh, all right, guys. Last topic here. Tyler Conklin. He did his media rounds a little bit and was asked a ton of questions about the Jets team, Aaron Rodgers, the expectations and all that. But we got to wrap up with the Jets here and talk about Tyler Conklin's comments about Dalvin Cook, who's an unrestricted free agent, going on 19 days since the Vikings released him, decided to go with Alexander Madison. Don't know why that's going on. But anyway, Dalvin Cook, free agent. He's trying to find a new team. And the Jets are rumored to be interested in him, along with the Dolphins, Bills, Patriots, a bunch of other teams that reportedly put offers into him. Tyler Conklin said, there's plenty of room for you, man, if you want to come to the Jets. So let me ask you guys a question. Brees Hall coming off an ACL tear from last year was taking the NFL by storm as, an, as a rookie. Was probably going to win Offensive Rookie of the Year until he had the injury happen, and then Garrett Wilson went ahead and had an incredible season as well. Do the Jets have the right – is it right move for them to get a Dalvin Cook into that team right now? If I'm Woody, jo- if Woody Johnson, you better get that uh, that private jet and fly out wherever he's at with Miami, fly out where he's at just like you did for Aaron Rodgers because this is that last piece you need on that roster to win the Super Bowl. To give yourself the best chance to win the Super Bowl, you would have a Dalvin Cook, and then you'll have a Brees Hall coming off an injury. Sign him to a two-year deal and let a, like a walk deal for that third year so he can go on. And that gives Brees Hall just enough time to split carries and then take over as number one on his contract. And you're not going to have to pay him that much because he's split carries throughout the last two years and running backs don't get paid uh, anyway. So Woody Johnson needs to get on that plane and make sure he goes and get, and Dalvin cook is in Florham park come July, uh, late July or, or August. Even you can even show up a little bit later if you want. Yeah. Look, I, I think the fact that we've heard the jets have interest in Dalvin cook tells you that they might think that Brees hall might not be as ready. Um, even though Robert Sala has been saying he's looking good and all that, Maybe he won't be as ready. And to Brand- I think what Brandon's saying, too, is you want to take that load and pressure off of him. 
We saw how great he was to start last season. You talked, Ryan, how about he was on his way to being uh, the offensive rookie of the year for the AFC, could have definitely done that. He was on that trajectory. You don't want to put a lot of pressure on him to be that guy. Dalvin Cook's a great guy that can take that pressure off him. They can split the carries. I love the contract terms that brought, that Brandon's talking about right there. I think that would be a good offer. Well, this is something Woody Johnson should look at getting it done because if the Jets have the playoff aspirations, and there I even say, as I know you want, Ryan, the Super Bowl aspirations, depth is going to be good, particularly at the running back position where we know we're talking about the safety of players and the health and the running backs take a lot of that pounding um, that they're going to do. So, yes, depth is necessary. And if you have a Dalvin Cook and a Brees Hall, man, you're cooking in that backfield. And uh, that's something I think the Jets should want. So I would, I would be, it'll be interesting for me to see if Woody Johnson is aggressive in pursuing this. But I think it's a move that makes sense for the Jets. A couple things here. Brandon saying that's the last piece makes me intrigued a little bit. That's the last piece for a Super Bowl contender because obviously you guys bring up great points about Brees Hall coming off that ACL. He's probably not going to be 100% even like you said, Dex, about Robert Sala saying, you know, we expect him to be ready by training camp. But I look back at that Saquon Barkley injury a couple of years ago. It took him a while to get back to his full storm, maybe even a full year for him before he became back to his old form of his old Saquon Barkley self. So you, I don't know if that's, that's – because the way the running rack room is constructed right now, you have a rookie in Izzy that they just drafted at Pittsburgh. I don't know if he's going to be a legit impact in his first year. And, you know, I just, there's not enough there, I think, to handle the load, especially when you're talking about offense that needs to be off and running with the opponents that they're facing to start the season, like the Buffalo Bills, the Patriots, the Cowboys. You're going to have to be able to get to establish the run a little bit with Aaron Rodgers and not put too much pressure on him. Obviously, there will be, but. I'd be all for it. I'd be ecstatic. It's just adding another weapon for Aaron Rodgers in that offense to to be a you know an electric offense to be a productive offense. So I'm all for it. Like Tyler Conklin said, he, he takes away it. pressure from from everybody, from Nathaniel Hackett to Aaron Rodgers to uh, Brees Hall. The because defense about, running the ball, controlling defense the ball, defense running the ball. You want to be able to play some smash mouth football early. You don't want to be at. You don't want Aaron Rodgers to have to throw the ball forty times in his first what five games. You yeah. don't want to hit that number at all in terms of passing attempts that first five games while you're getting him acclimated to new weapons. Uh, I know it's the same offense, but just a whole bunch of weapons yeah. together for the first time. So if you have a Dalvin Cook healthy, ready to go, ready to go, and, and not he's got prove it tatted on his chest right now in terms of coming back and proving the Vikings wrong. You let him cook the first half of the season while Brees Hall gets his legs back under him. Then at the second half, you can take some of that pressure off Dalvin because now you can add some of those carries to Brees Hall. Now at the same time, Aaron Rodgers is throwing because I want to. We're throwing the ball because I want to. If I see two high safeties, I'm not going to check out of it. If Even if I see eight in the box, I still might not check out of it because I know Dalvin might get one-on-one with this safety and make a miss instead of trying to throw out of that. So while you're getting everything in order right now, you you know, you're getting it right. You're getting you all, you got all the groceries. You know what I'm saying? You didn't put the little Gogoya in there. You done put some ayahuasca in there. You know, you got Garrett Wilson. You got, you put you, Alvin, you, you, uh, Lazar, you putting all that in there, right? Conklin. Man, no. Now, sometimes you got, you got to stir slow. You got to stir slow. But no, then I in agree. The day, you got churn, baby churn, like the uh, that Fresh Prince Bel Air. But at, at the, but at the end of the day, you want it to cook. It's got to be nice. The recipe's got to be nice. And this would be that last recipe. This that jerk chicken right there, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Oh, it's that not, jerk. not not like that one I posted on Twitter the other day. That man with the terrible jerk chicken recipe. If y'all check, <laughs> my, check, check my check horrible. my tweets, yeah, you not saw that, that jerk right? recipe, that, not that jerk. <laughs> this Dalvin Cook though, yeah, let Dalvin Cook guys. That's all I got for you, man. That's another episode. Appreciate you as always. Appreciate you, man. Peace.